my gals. Uh, I love you both very much. Um, I just found out I was pregnant this morning, which, yeah, I figured would be interesting to call in because I doubt you have any others like this. And if they if you do, Godspeed. Uh, my partner and I are like super in love. We both want kids. We both want to get married in the future. We're both working the shittiest jobs ever and are in, super in debt. I like panic scheduled the abortion this morning <clears throat> for, for like a week from now. And now I have a week to sit here with all of those thoughts in my mind, knowing that eventually we do want this, but that it's like happening now. And I have no idea what to do ethically. So torn across all the things. I figured it'd be way more fun for you guys to tear me apart than myself. Um, yeah, probably just kill myself instead. So <laughs> I love you both. Merry Christmas. Bye. I was having such a good time. You got to keep now, the baby. Now, now mood is over. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't, time is of the essence. I can't tell anyone She's to got keep it on the baby, that. but my hunch is you should keep the baby. You got to keep the baby. And it's a great blessing. And if you will regret it if you don't. Especially if you're with someone that you are in love with and want to have a baby with. Yeah. And I just want to say that, um, having a baby is a lot cheaper than you think it will be mm -hmm. it's very manageable it's very doable on a low budget i mean it's a very like pick your own adventure like if you want to get the most expensive clothes and toys and like crap you can but or you can't because <laughs> you're poor <laughs> no if, but, but should but, you be in that position you you could really knock yourself out but you don't have to like all babies need is love and some calories i mean it's yeah people i got into it with um after your free press debate with that guy ben burgess <laughs> all right uh i am ben burgess this is give them an argument i am joined as always by our suit oh. the fuck is jake i i thought you had him oh shit okay well, we lost Jake now. Uh, Jake is still on vacation, uh, so presumably at this moment he's, uh, you know, he's sitting on a, a beach chair with like a, a really elaborate cocktail that's like inside of a, a coconut. Um, and, you know, he's kind of trying to watch the episode on his phone, but he's drifted off to sleep as he's doing it because, you know, there's so much sun and this is like his third coconut cocktail. Um but uh jake will be back next week um he's not doing any of that he's in new orleans right now but uh yeah he's probably, he probably is on a cocktail just not a coconut cocktail yeah yeah no coconut no beach but uh i'm in a plastic cup walking down bourbon street right now that actually that one is entirely possible uh, but as i said uh he uh he will be back uh next week uh right now i'm joined by a very talented graphic designer j andrew world in uh, a little bit, I am going to be joined by Will Cooper, who is a op-ed columnist, uh, nationally syndicated, uh, who uh, who wrote um, uh, who wrote an op-ed that was uh, that was called a Democrat's case uh, for DeSantis, uh, which I ended up doing a uh, a response to in uh in jacobin uh man we need jacob having trouble uh sorting through the graphics but uh in any case uh i wrote a response to in uh in jacobin uh he makes this kind of technocratic argument uh that uh desantis was actually the lesser evil compared to uh either trump or biden uh because essentially uh trump is this unprecedented threat and biden is senile so even though he's a democrat and he has all these liberal policy preferences he would still prefer desantis and uh i wrote uh this response in um in in jacobin uh making you know making the case that a this doesn't make any sense and b um like even the particulars of the case don't make any sense. We'll get into all that when he's on and B that I think this is sort of deeply indicative of a much larger problem with um, sort of mainstream technocratic liberalism that, you know, this is sort of a zany expression of it. 
but that this is, you know, this is a, a much an indication, like a sort of odd symptom of a much larger pathology. The limbs are not all right. Uh, that, uh, that, there is this deep tendency in contemporary American liberalism to see politics not as clashes of ideology or certainly clashes of material interests, but as a matter of the, you know, people, sort of smart people kind of technocratically finding the fixes for the problems that, uh, that ail us. And I think that's a much bigger problem. In any case, uh, after my article came out, he was like, Hey, I'm, you know, happy to come on, on the show to you know, hash it out. And I said, sure. And, you know, let's you know find a time that makes sense to do it. Uh, and uh, today, tonight is the, uh, you know, this is the Iowa caucuses. Uh, not a lot of suspense, but uh, there maybe is about the future of the DeSantis campaign. So this seems like a good time to have that discussion. So, uh, so Will's going to be on then. Then during the last part of the main show, we are going to have... Um, Ben Fong, uh, who is uh, a previous guest, is uh, the author of Quick Fixes, uh, which uh, which he was on the show to talk about before. Um, he is also um, he also is doing this limited series podcast for Jacobin on the history of the CIO called uh, Organized the Unorganized. So we're going to talk to him about that. Should be a lot of fun. Should be really interested. Really looking forward to that. And then uh, Ravana is going to be joining us in the post game, not for the first time, but the first first time in a very long time. I looked it up, and it was like 2022 or something. Um, and uh, it's the post game, just hanging out with patrons. So we are uh, we are going to, um, you know, we've we've had our we've had our meat. We can eat our pudding. Uh, the uh, uh, we are going to be watching Alex Jones's appearance on the Jimmy Dore show. Uh, so, uh, in any case, uh, lots of fun stuff coming up, but let's go back to the clip that we used as a, as a cold open. Um, Jake, uh, actually, uh, I don't know, a week or two ago, um, messaged me. It was like, Hey, I got a notification. Ben Burgess has become a member of Red Scare. Uh, and he was, he was just, I think, giving me like a little bit of a hard time about it. Uh, and cause you know, Patreon does that sometimes, you know, there are people you're patrons of, they become patrons of other things that lets you know. And the reason is that, uh, that episode that that's from, uh, somebody had DM me to tell me that it was in there. And, uh, at the time it was paywalled. I haven't actually listened much to Red Scare in years. Uh, Dasha there. So the two hosts are Anna and Dasha. Um, and Dasha, who's the person who was talking about this conversation that she had with me, uh, is was actually years and years ago when she was much more left wing, uh, was a guest on this show. Uh, and so when we ran into each other a few months ago and had this conversation that she's talking about, it was, you know, it was, it was friendly, you know, like, hey, Ben, you know, uh, but, uh, but, you know, much more political disagreement now. So uh, that is... Um, uh, that is what that's about. And uh, I want to think about how to frame this. Uh, so, you know, I probably wouldn't have uh, said anything about it since uh, if I have a conversation with somebody in real life, I always kind of, you know, common sense exception, exceptions notwithstanding, right? I, I generally assume that that's private. Uh, but, um, but, you know, it was mentioned on Red Scare. We can talk about it here. Uh, so, um, so we are going to um, we are going to play uh, the, the sort of subsequent discussion on Red Scare of this argument that I had with uh, with Dasha. But first, I want to give you some larger context for uh, how it came up in the first place, the event where we saw each other, because this is going to help sort of make sense of what this conversation was about. Um, and by the way, if you don't, you know, if, if like the opening thing was confusing, I think it's like once a year, twice a year, um, they do this thing on the Red Scare podcast. They'll call it like a love line episode where people will uh, call in with their relationship problems and things like that. Uh, and they'll, you know, sometimes answer them. I think sometimes lightly make fun of them, whatever, you know, you've, you've listened to the radio, you know, how stuff like this, uh, works. Uh, and, um, in any case, 
So, uh, the context of Sayyid Dasha was this uh, event in LA back in September. Uh, it was this debate uh, that happened at the uh, the Ace Theater. Uh, and rather than me describing it, uh, since this is kind of a convoluted, like the sort of lineup of people is is sort of very strange and uh, whatever, um, I I think it's better to just show you. Um, uh, we we put together a little montage here. So the first part is the little video that they actually played at the event to set it up, and that's in their the organizers' video of the beginning of the debate. Um, and then, you know, and then it, we sort of mashed that together with, uh, with Barry Weiss, who was the moderator introducing, uh, the, the debaters and, um, you know, all I'll say about it in advance is it was kind of refreshing to go to an event like this, just as like an audience member. Um, cause usually if there's a bizarre sort of constellation of people on a stage, a debate up there, I actually have to like argue with them. Uh, and, and in this case, it was just kind of relaxing. I could just, you know, sit back and enjoy the show. Um, you know, probably, uh, as you'll, you'll kind of get a sense of not an overwhelmingly left-wing crowd or anything. I mean, I mean, I was there with, um, uh, Waz, uh, big Waz, uh, who, who used to come out for Sopranos episodes and Anna Kasparian and, uh, we didn't come together or anything, but I, Amber Frost from Chapo was, was, was there also, right? So there, there were a few, uh, members of the uh, the uh, left media who were sort of scattered around uh, go into this thing. But as far as who's actually on stage, again, I will just let the, uh, the video set that up. Ours is a rich and variant land. We have bounties beyond those known to the people of any other day. And as responsible as anyone else for the care of these bounties is the woman in the American home. What we are talking about is a revolution. 50 years ago, the sexual revolution changed what it meant to be a woman. For the first time, we will have true human sexual liberation. Then it went on to change the world. The women in this country will secure equality. When you make laws apply equally to men and women, you end up taking away many of the rights that women now have. I really don't know what women are asking for. Whatever it is they're asking for, honey, it's not for you. <laughs> I've heard a lot of young men saying, my household's sort of upset since Jermaine Greer came. Oh, I wish that was true. Pornography has never been shown to hurt women and, any and more than it hurts wrong. men or that children. That is wrong. There's only two occupations in this country in which women get paid more than men. One is modeling and the other is prostitution. My working relationship became even more strained when Judge Thomas began to use work situations to discuss sex. I feel like I can't make a move with someone beating down on me saying, you're being too sexy. You know, I vigorously support the Violence Against Women Act. The defense secretary has lifted the ban on women serving in combat. <laughs> The movement promised women political power, economic equality, and sexual freedom. But for all the gains, what have we lost? For all the freedoms we've found, are there one too many unintended consequences? I make 250k a Jesus. month. <laughs> Now that we can sleep with whoever we want, why are we having so little sex? What is an incel? <laughs> and if we're so liberated, why are we so unhappy? As we became the men we thought we'd marry, what actually happened to men? It's better than happiness, but it's almost unbearable. And what comes next? They just want to see me prance around in my cleavage. Let me finish yeah. my point, okay. and then we can okay. argue against it. These are the questions we think are worth asking out loud and in public. You don't own me. The tension between freedom and feminism. Women are equal to men. 
then be equal. Do 50% of the hard job. This feminism that we see, the way the, the way that it's practiced, it's like this bubblegum feminism. We're in this giant hiccup into a different part of civilization mm, that is culture. extremely unprecedented. Sex and sovereignty. People used to believe that sex was, was sacred, was special. Feminists have this idea that if we acknowledge that we're different, we're acknowledging that we're unequal. Biology and ideology. There's nothing wrong with porn. I'm calling for an end to the sex war in feminism. Urgent questions that have captured generations before us. I was asking myself, is this success? And that we still grapple with today. It's really troubling to me. So let's debate. Has the sexual revolution failed? Arguing in the affirmative, yes, the sexual revolution has failed. We have all the way from London, the author Louise Perry. <laughs> Louise literally wrote the book on this subject. It's called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. If you haven't read it, you have to pick it up. Welcome, Louise. Joining Louise on the pro side of the argument, I know she's got some fans in the house, is the singular Anna Kachian. As everyone here seems to know, Anna is a cultural critic, a writer, and the co-host of the podcast Red Scare. Which, as one reviewer put it, has the unique ability to make everybody angry. Anna, welcome. And now, the opposing side of the argument. Here to argue that no, the sexual revolution has not failed is the great Sarah Hader. Yes, give it up for Sarah. Sarah is a Pakistani-born writer, speaker, and activist, best known for co-founding ex-Muslims of North America. She currently writes on the substack, Hold That Thought. Please welcome Sarah Hader. And last, but certainly not least, Grimes. Grimes is a singer, songwriter, and record producer with five studio albums under her belt. She was recently named by Time as one of the 100 most influential people in AI. Among my favorite things she has said is this. Personally, I don't think Manic Pixie Dream Girl is an insult. I identify exactly with all of those terms. Grimes, otherwise known as Claire, and C, welcome. Yeah, so um, one of the Red Scare Girls and uh, Louise Perry is this British, you know, uh, conservative writer, I think it would be fair to say. Um, I actually got a little bit more insight into that after the debate, um, but uh, arguing about sexual revolution uh, with, uh, sorry, Louise Perry, right, is the person I just mentioned with Sarah Hayter and uh, Grimes, because why not? Yeah, <laughs> I, I guess, yeah, uh, I guess I'm glad it's all women. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, entirely female panel there. Um so uh yeah this is like you know I, i've mentioned this on the show before but i i keep thinking you know thinking about that lineup right you know i, I kept thinking about uh the year before when i did that debate in new york with uh tim pool james o'keefe and tulsi gabbard and um the uh <laughs> which is yeah summer of 2022 is long enough that theoretically uh the organizers thought I had this whole argument with them about it, that, uh, that, um, it's like, Oh, say Tulsi. She's like, you know, she's like a lefty. Right. So, uh, and, uh, so it was balanced, you know? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd suggested Sam Cedar, but for various reasons, uh, 
I actually talked about it in the majority report. You can look that up. We, we replayed that clip. Uh, that didn't happen. But uh, in any case, um, I remember when I was I was telling my editor at, at Jacobin, Megan, about this before it happened. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be in New York this weekend. Here's what I'm doing. She told me it sounded like I was describing a dream I'd had. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, the Tulsi Gabbard was also there for some reason. <laughs> um, and this is very much the sense I get describing this. Oh, yeah, so I went to this would see this debate with the red scare girls and grimes uh but uh in any case uh there is a um uh you know we do have another um uh montage of some of what each of those four people uh said in the debate uh just to um you know, just to give you some sense of what the actual substance was, because it is going to set up the interaction with Tasha. That you have the radicalism of the 1960s, encouraging a rejection of tradition, a rejection of religion, a rejection of all the bourgeois sexual norms of the past. It never mattered how much, uh, it never mattered how women felt about sex. This is why it's so hard to accept the logic that's shared by many in the anti-sex revolution camp, that the sexual revolution has been bad for women's ability to say no to sex. They're just being pressured to say, sex all, to say yes all the time to hookups that they don't want. But it couldn't possibly be the case that sex is more coercive. Now we have to think about what can that be compared to exactly? the storied past where our great-grandmothers were having countless orgasms with no coercion whatsoever. Nor can I claim, as my partner has, that the failure of the sexual revolution comes down to the fact that what originally started out with the goal of liberating women now mainly serves to benefit men. Realistically, men really only had a few decades of enjoying the fruits of the pill before Title IX and Me Too made male sexuality presumptively illegal. Um, okay. I'm not good at reading or public speaking, but let's... And that was really good. So it's stressful. Uh, <clears throat> Tonight, I argue that the sexual re revolution will be successful. A revolution is a bomb, and violence cannot be a, a success in and of itself, because violence is a means to an end. But the sexual revolution is incomplete, and therefore much nearer to success than failure. Revolutions historically fail when their violent nature becomes their identity, but they succeed when an improved culture is rebuilt in their wake. Yeah, so that gives you a flavor of what all four of those people were like. Um, you know, essentially, uh, Louise Perry, who's the first speaker, and uh, Sarah Hayter, uh, who's the, the second, both of them came prepared for like a real debate. Uh, that, you know, like they, they had, I mean, Louise Perry wrote a book about it. You know, Sarah Hayter had this like very organized, clear counter argument. You saw some of there and then, uh, yeah, Red Scare and I was just, uh, you know, she was making barbs, roasting the panel a bit, you know, it was basically a lot like listening to an episode of Red Scare and, uh, Grimes was, you know, you could choose to find it irritating or you could choose to find it adorable. I sort of went back and forth, but uh, Grimes spent a lot of time apologizing about being bad at public speaking. And, um, you know, it was was a little bit of a mess, but uh, that's the, you know, <laughs> that's what that experience was like uh, sitting there in that theater watching that thing. I'm just glad that, it, you know, she didn't say like, I'm bad at public speaking. Now drop that beat and then sing her response. <laughs> I mean, it would have been much more entertaining. So yes. uh, <laughs> just like if she'd just done that every time it was her turn. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so basically like Sarah Hayter, who I'm sure I have lots of other political disagreements with, she seems at least, you know, vaguely IDW adjacent as far as from what very little I know about her, which is almost nothing, right? But if you're just judging by what she said at the debate, and we'll, I'm sure we'll do an actual debate breakdown of this someday, but if you're just judging by what she said at the debate, like I, I agreed with pretty much everything she said at the debate, right? Like, I, I think, um, I think everything she said, you know, like that point that you just got a little snippet of and, you know, another one you're, you're going to see in a minute, I think is true as far as it goes. Uh, my, my basic, uh, critique, I was talking to Anna and Waz about, you know, at, as we were like leaving the thing itself before Waz and I went to the after party, uh, 
where the conversation is going to happen is that, yeah, I think everything Sarah Hayter said is true as far as it goes, but like she and everybody else sort of conducted the debate in this way that kind of pretended that economics didn't exist. Um, and that like all of this was just played out at the level of culture and, and there are no material conditions uh, that are shaping it. So that would be my critique, but uh, I want to play just the bit that's going to be most relevant. And then we'll go back to Red Scare. I do want to talk about, you know, a person who I think gets overlooked in this conversation. And I know we're, I'm, we're going back to the time before the sexual revolution because that's actually what we're debating right now. But um, uh, we talk about single mothers and their existence today. There are more of them, it's true. Um, prior to the sexual revolution, between the post-war period and the sexual revolution, there were fewer single mothers than there are now, but there were far, far many more children who were being put up for adoption by mothers who wanted to keep them. This was called the baby scoop era, and I think that it really, you guys should go home and look, them, look it up, maybe, because it was a horrifying time. Um, the rates of American babies that were being put up for adoption were extremely high. There was a peak of it that was like, you know, 89,000 or something. Um, and, then, and then it declined. It declined fast. The second women were able to get an ounce of freedom, an ounce of, of understanding and acceptance, there were literally tens of thousands or more babies in the arms of their biological mothers who wanted them because the stigma got better. Anyway, I think that's a... While we're considering trade-offs, I think we should think about this one, Okay, too. well, let's talk a little bit. Grimes, do you want to jump in, or can I...? Well, I, I don't, either way, up to you guys. Go. Oh, um, I guess what I would say is, like, Again, like we keep talking about symptoms and like if, like if you want to get back to the root cause, it's like the schools are fucked. People are not educated. People don't even understand their own fertility. They don't, like they don't understand how to not get pregnant. They don't understand what to do with. They do get pregnant. Uh, ki kids have bad outcomes because kids are like not literate. Like kids are graduating from grade nine. Like, like we are in a massive literacy crisis. It's like that's not the parents' fault. That's like... You know, like, our system is, is fundamentally failing, and it's fundamentally failing children first. Um, and, like, even just at the airport, like, wh why is the mom always in the... How does the whole line not move for, like, the moms to go to the front? I just, like, our culture, our culture doesn't make it easy to have kids. And, and so it's like, we, we're like, oh, single mothers, it's, like, it's, it's not doing well. It's like, no, the whole culture should fucking move Children are sacred. We won't live as a species if we don't have more kids. And we're like personally not a replacement, right? Let's talk a little bit about picking up, Sarah, on what you said about trade-offs. Because I think maybe the weakest part of this side's audience, so, sorry, this side's argument, <laughs> not the audience, we love you, is compared to what, right? Like it, I was editing a piece today about Masi Amini the young Iranian woman who, you guys will remember her name, killed by the morality police in Tehran under the Islamic Republic for the sin of showing her hair, right? That is what it is to live in a country that doesn't have this kind of freedom. How do you contend with that, right? How do you argue, against, like, if we look at other countries that haven't had a sexual revolution, sure, they don't have OnlyFans, they don't have Pornhub, they don't have people catching feelings, but <laughs> like they have cultures in which to be a woman showing your hair could be something punishable by death. How do you contend with that? I mean, I don't think that we are arguing that we should go back to that, and I don't think that <laughs> we never even really had it. Yeah, we're not trying to execute women for attempting to obtain an abortion or having extramarital sex. Um, we're just talking about, um, you know, Grimes points out that we live in a society that's uniquely unfriendly toward mothers and children, which I think is, is true and correct. Um, part of the reason that it is that way is due to the sexual revolution. That's something we can blame the sexual revolution for. Um, because young women who grew up not knowing what to rebel against have a frankly antinatalist and contemptuous attitude toward the sanctity of the family. 
it doesn't occur to them. They, they, simply, they simply don't have the receptors to understand what it means to love somebody else more than yourself and to sacrifice yourself for them. And that is because, that is because as, as Louise said, this was primarily a uh, technological revolution first that um, introduced contraception and then abortion on an industrial scale and decoupled sex from procreation. I don't, I don't know that I want to go back to recoupling sex and procreation strictly. That's not for me to decide. But there has to be, again, some middle ground. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's that, that last comment, right, that, uh, that sets up this interaction, that this sort of saying, okay, the, the reason why, um, you know, birth rates, for example, are low in the United States, according to Anna Karkachian, is that we live in a antinatalist culture, that that's, that that's the problem. It's the culture, uh, it's the culture that did it. And uh, so when I, uh, you know, at the after party, um, I, um, you know, I ran into her co-host Dasha and, you know, we, as I said, you know, had a perfectly friendly conversation, but, you know, she asked me what I thought about the debate and I brought that up and took issue with it. And, um, and then, you know, here's the, you know, here's her description of the conversation after that. Cause he was at the after party and mm-hmm. said that, cause you made some, you made a remark about us living in a basically like an antinatalist culture. Yeah. And mm-hmm. he was saying, you know, he was taking this very like Marxoid kind of, um, argument that we aren't in an antinatalist culture. It's the people don't have the means. They keep saying that these leftists of please. reproduction. Well, please, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that it's, um, but I think that that's clearly not true. I mean, I actually believe her that she and her boyfriend have like shitty no, low paying jobs of and course. like she's many real. such cases, yeah. but many, <clears throat> uh, like poor countries that don't have antinatalist sentiments because they're Catholic mm-hmm. have tons of kids and are poor as shit. All right. And, um, I just wanted to, you know, you know, cause she, she did just, you know, air this on, uh, on Red Scare. Uh, I did just want to say a few words in, uh, in defense of my, uh, Marxoid argument that, um, that people <laughs> are, uh, uh, that, uh, that people's, you know, family planning decisions have something to do with economics. Um, and, uh, and, and sort of the main thing that I would say about this is that um, we don't actually have to speculate about what people's reasons are for making the family planning decisions they do because there are polls. We could just ask them and they'll tell us. Uh, and so this is something that I wrote about uh, a couple times uh, several months before the debate. Uh, so this was at like the tail end of 2022. Um I uh, I wrote two articles, one for Jackman, one for the Daily Beast, that uh, that made you know versions of this point, right? So, uh, one of them uh, was uh, called Ben Shapiro was talking nonsense about the left undermining families. Um, uh, so you can see the deck there. It says Ben Shapiro absurdly says the left supports uh, gay marriage to undermine families and turn us into quote atomized individuals unquote. The reality left to suppose social atomization, what families have the economic support that they need. And the other one for the Daily Beast is called uh, Jordan Peterson's Politics, um, Make Life Harder for Young Men. And the deck is uh, the right-wing uh, self-help guru wants to uh, help disaffected males, but he advocates for policies and politicians that prevent them from getting married and having kids. Uh, and since it's the Daily Beast, they also do that little I don't know. I don't even know what you call that. That little uh, extra little bit of text that's diagonal across the top. Uh, <laughs> in, this, in this case, says no lobsters for the unemployed, uh, which is good. I, I don't know who writes those, but uh, they do good work. Uh, but in any case, uh, the, you know, the point I make in both is, again, 
we don't have to speculate. Um, so in um, the Ben Shapiro one, I think I, I, I looked up uh, the, you know, this is for the New York Times. Uh, here is a poll. Uh, why young adults are having fewer children than their ideal number. So this is for uh, people who said that they had or expected to have uh, fewer children than they considered ideal. Here's uh, the share that cited each of the following reasons as a factor. These don't add up to, you know, these add up to many more than 100. You're allowed to pick more than one. But um, by far, by far the most common reason cited by people who have had, you know, fewer children than they would like to is childcare is too expensive at 64 percent right uh next up uh is one more time for the children that i have uh which i would point out is not unrelated to uh you know to uh economic concerns we'll get into that in a second uh next uh is worried about the economy uh next is can't afford more children next is waited because of financial instability uh next uh is one more leisure time so again let's think about how that relates in a second uh next is not enough fam uh paid family leave next is no family leave um and then uh worried about global instability uh struggle with work-life balance and um, it goes on and on, but I just read off the top like 10, I think about on uh, this list. And I would point out that the, um, that out of these top several, again, I think that was about, about nine or 10 that I just read. Uh, the only ones that are economic on their face are what more time with the children I have, what more leisure time. Um, yeah, that's it. Right. And I would point out that this is not unrelated to not enough uh to um uh to um uh to uh struggle with work life balance right if you know like that if you are working all the time right this is not unrelated to not enough time for the children i have or um what more leisure time right these are you know these are related and you know you could argue of course that um you know i mean basically the argument that dasha does make in that clip and that, i mean we actually ended up arguing about this for a pretty long time right like that was that was pretty long discussion um and uh yeah there was a i'm not going to try to do a dasha nekromska uh imitation because it's you know it, it's just not going to come off well if i try to do that but uh there, there was a point where this a little lilt to her voice, you know, she asked me, do you think I'm a fascist? And I was like, no, no, I, I don't think that. I think you're wrong. <laughs> right. And then we just kind of got, you know, more into it. But, um, but in any case, um, you know, you could make the argument that, that she did, you know, in person and in the Red Scare uh, segment that, uh, well, what counts as being cash strapped, uh, or working too much or not having enough savings in the United States in the 21st century is not necessarily what counts at other times or other places, right? And, you know, that's fine. That's true, right? Um, no denying that. But I also don't really think it's relevant. It's like, yes, of course. Like, that's just a general fact about human history that, you know, what people, you know, as uh, go really Marxoid, the the forces of production develop, um, you know, whether it's the capacity of a society to fulfill people's material needs to produce stuff as that develops over time as class struggle uh, helps determine, uh, you know, how much of it, how much of what's produced stays with working class people and how much uh, is extracted by the owners, of the means of production as all of those things happen. Yeah, of course. Like what counts as a decent standard of living is going to be highly historically and geographically variable, no question. But what of it, right? Like it's like yes, it is nevertheless a fact that what counts in the twenty first, you know, the United States, the twenty first century, as below a reasonable standard, below what people would consider, you know, economic security, uh, etc., 
is what it is. You know, people aren't comparing themselves uh, to um, to Guatemalan peasant farmers, right? People are comparing themselves to say their own parents at the same age, right? So, you know, you can just wish that, um, you know, people in the first world in the 21st century, you know, expected less. And all I can say is good luck with that. Right. Or, um, you know, or you could acknowledge that they're, they're not going to, and that they're going to have the economic standards that they have. And in fact, it is just a, a fact about the last several decades of American history and, you know, certainly not just American that, uh, there has been you know, neoliberalism, the, uh, the rise of a, um, of a more precarious uh, kind of relationship that most people, you know, or, you know, that an increasing number of people have with the economy in various ways, a decline in the kind of uh, social democratic activism of the state, uh, certainly decline in the power of organized labor, and all of these things have effects on people's lives. And if you ask people, right, why aren't you uh, why aren't you, you know, having as many children as you would like to, or there are similar polls that I looked at for this for like people who aren't married, who'd like to be, et cetera, all, you know, in that top 10 or whatever it was, right. Every single one, right. Is either partially or directly and obviously economic. And, you know, I, I'll acknowledge that some of this is just a values question that, um, you know, as she has drifted right in the years uh, since she was a guest on this show, um, you know, I, yeah, I mean, you know, Dasha, you know, I suppose, I don't know that I totally understand her worldview now, but, uh, you know, there, there seems to be this like conservative Catholic element, uh, to it. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I guess she thinks that as well, if people really valued, uh, the right things that they would just suck it up no matter what. Uh, but, uh, one, Again, I don't think that's particularly realistic. And two, of course, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a whatever godless, uh, you know, uh, you know, heathen leftist. Uh, I have, um, I, I don't, I don't really care about which life decisions people are making. Right. I, I just want them to have the support to, um, you know, make the ones that they want, you know, as, as long as they're not hurting anybody. And, um, you know, and, and so, you know, I think people should have as many or as few children as they want to have, but this is a pretty damn widespread human desire and, uh, and a decent society would make it much easier for people. And, um, and it's, and it seems to me, I mean, I know it's not as fun. It's not culture war, red meat, but it seems to me that if you want to have a serious conversation about this, uh, you just can't do it without the economics. Absolutely. Uh, as a parent myself, just the financial stress of having a child and trying to support them and giving them what they need is, is a lot. And it's, it's more than just, you know, giving them food and having them, letting them have nice things. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot more than just that, you know, and that's, that's all, um, and I'm assuming that the the um, ladies from Red Scare don't have kids. Uh, Anna does. Dasha does not. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think Anna has a kid, and it's relatively recent, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, but um, but uh, but you know, and, and I also I also think um, you know, and I also think that uh, Anna and you know. Dasha, should she ever decide to have kids or, you know, probably, um, <laughs> let's put it this way. I don't, I don't think they're going to notice whether or not I'm on their Patreon. Uh, that's, you know, uh, I think they're going to be okay. Right. You yeah. know, and that's, and that's not a, that's not a dig, right. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's not a bad thing, you know, to, to be successful at, you know, what you're doing, but, uh, but it is maybe a, a reality check about this that, um, you know, that, there are, um, you know, there are, are a lot more parents who are in your position than uh, Anna Karkachian's uh, in, uh, in, in the country, right? And uh, as, as a whole, and uh, it is expensive in, you know, many, many ways, right? Of course it is, right? It's, it's, I mean, this is 
you know, we don't, we don't even, you know, we don't even have free healthcare in this, in this country, right? You know, your, your kid gets sick. You have to, you have to pay money, right? You know, to, uh, you know, we don't have free college, you know, if they, they go to college, right? You know, you, uh, have to either, um, you know, uh, you have to either pay for it or, you know, or, 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 you know, sort of see them go into, to, to debt and, you know, like whatever it's, it's, uh, you know, there are, you know, children have, uh, again, I suppose if you're going to say, well, Hey, you know, if you could just kind of reproduce them, you know, like, yeah, if you're going to raise the, your kids, the material level of 12th century English peasants or something that, you know, then maybe it's not that expensive, but you know, yeah. That's not what anybody in the first world in the 21st century wants to do. And if you're interested in figuring out what their motivations are, it it's really not that, you know, some bizarre psychological event happened where, you know, human beings decided to stop wanting to reproduce, right? You know, it's, um, you know, it like, it is much, much more that, you know, lots of people who who would like kids feel like they can't afford them or, you know, even if they have a kid, right. You know, they, they, they're not going to have two kids or, you know, et cetera. Right. Uh, for, for all those reasons, I mean, not, not everybody, right. You know, of course, right. We're talking about statistical trends, but, uh, if you're, if you're looking, if you're trying to figure out, you know, what changed from, like that video that the debate organizers put out that, that like fun little video to start with, right. Where everything's going on in that video is going on at the level of culture. And they start out with these like, you know, cheesy, like 1950s, uh, homemaker images. And it's like, look, what changed between the first images and the, you know, only fans or whatever, whatever we're doing by the end of that video, I don't even remember. Right. Uh, is, is not just the cultural more has changed. Of course, that's a thing that's changed. Right. But also in those earlier videos, we're in an economy where um, a uh, where a, a high school uh, high school graduate with a single income uh, could could support uh, a family, including including the homemaker in that in that video. Right. Like that's the fundamental thing that uh, that changed. Right. Which, by the way. Right. I don't think anybody, you know, I I I I. Again, I agree with everything Sarah Hayter said in the debate as far as it goes. I, I, I think that the cultural mores of the 1950s were, were awful, right? And I, 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 I would have zero desire to go back to them, right? Uh, the, um, uh, and, and certainly was much more you know, coercion and gender relations and all of that stuff, which is terrible. But also, like, look, I think wanting to stay home with your kids is fine. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think there should be any gender-based pressures for anybody to do it right but if uh if one parent wants to do that or you know both parents want to work part-time so they could both spend more time with their kids whatever right like i think that's something a decent society should facilitate and um you know you can ritually say the word family over and over again uh and um and you could deplore antinatalist culture you know until you're blue in the face but um uh, you're not going to have actually addressed um, the reasons for, for the trends you need to, you need to, uh, yeah. I mean, you need to engage with stuff that might be a lot more boring. Like, you know, 64% of people who haven't had as many kids as they'd like to uh, say, you know, list childcare being too expensive is the reasons, right? So it's like, maybe that's, less fun than the stuff that was being, you know, discussed in this debate, but, um, you know, free childcare, which by the way, is something I think the left should talk way more about. I, I, I'm all, I'm all in favor of free college, but I think it's a problem that I think it's a telling problem that we spend so much less time talking about free childcare than free college. Um, you know, that, uh, that that's, you know, that is the kind of sort of mundane social democratic thing that would actually help with that and um that is what i have to say about that but we have been keeping our guest waited uh so i want to transition um so uh as i said today is uh is caucus day uh i, I was on the central central time zone right so uh um, so. okay so it's like almost eight in iowa I don't, I don't know i don't know where we are as far as actual results yet 
Um, haven't really had a chance to uh, to look. I know that, um, you know, of course, it's not really happening on the Democratic side. Uh, they essentially canceled the Iowa caucus. Uh, they're caucusing, but just for internal party stuff, the candidate selection uh, is going to be by a mail-in vote, the results of which will not be announced until Super Tuesday, which is their punishment for uh, <laughs> for uh, for going for Bernie in 2020, I think. Um, but um, but the Republican caucus is happening, which is which is what's more relevant to uh, what I'm about to talk about with Will. And of course, uh, by far, uh, by a mile, uh, the leading candidate is this guy. If you can't sit home, if you're sick as a dog, you say, darling, I got to back Even if you vote and then pass away, it's worth it. I, <laughs> I, I don't even know what you say about that. That is, uh, that, uh, no, that is what it is. Like comedy gold that trump always brings uh that much is true uh so uh on that and note, if uh, you're wondering right now early results uh 55.3 percent for trump uh so far and uh nikki haley is at second place at 19 percent and uh followed at the end with uh ron DeSantis at 17 percent Okay, so not a not a huge gap between Haley and DeSantis. Yeah, there's very few counties that are pointing in, so you know this is obviously a developing, you know, n not a final number or anything. But yeah, and and I think if I'm not mistaken, um, I think the more rural counties often report later uh, in Iowa. I don't, I'm not. Um, I feel like that's something. Uh, that might be true and might be relevant, but uh, in any case, uh, we will see uh, how all that shakes out. But on that note, uh, Andy, I will see you in the post game, and we are going to bring on uh, Will Cooper, who is uh, the author. Uh, the reason he's here today is he wrote a op-ed. Uh, called uh, Democrats Case for DeSantis, but uh, he is also the author of this book, uh, How America Works and Why It Doesn't, A Brief Guide to the U.S. Political System. How are you doing, William? Doing great, Ben. Thank you. Good to be here. And uh, I really liked your last segment. I, I, uh, it was entertaining. I, I wanted to get started with my uh, talking on some of those points you made, and I, and I actually agreed with uh, well, almost right, yeah. everything you said, I thought was was spot on, and it's a super important area. So I'm glad you're focusing on it. Well, I appreciate that, uh, and, and that maybe that does set up what we're about to talk about, though, right? Because yeah. um, because uh, the the argument that you were making in uh, Democrats' case for DeSantis, and that you know last year when that came out, that I was responding to in in Jacobin, uh, was as the the title indicates a a case for um for for Ron DeSantis as the as like the the you know best of the worst or whatever you know the uh, the lesser evil for for president and of course everything that that we we're just talking about is all stuff uh, that uh that that points in exactly the opposite direction of what DeSantis's you know career has been has been spent fighting for right I mean you know he he doesn't want to you know, he doesn't want to give people free childcare, reduced work hours, uh, so they get better, you know, work life balance. Uh, he was against uh, a ballot initiative in Florida to uh, to to raise the minimum wage to to fifteen dollars an hour. You know, he has the the positions on you know organized labor, on healthcare, on all this stuff that you would uh, expect, right? A, a Republican presidential candidate to uh to have right so, which so so this is this seems again so like it's it's pointed in very much the opposite direction from from what we kind of agreed that that the two of us want right so yeah. uh so 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 what gives right what's the yeah. what's the case so um stepping back a little bit i think what you said least worst mm -hmm. right the column was very clear this was binary analysis, either Joe Biden or Ron DeSantis, right? And I, I made the point that 
we can hopefully all agree, at least a, a lot of us, Donald will set Trump aside because a lot of yeah. us that disagree about Biden versus DeSantis agree that Trump would not be a good president. And I feel mm -hmm. very strongly about that. So setting that aside, we've got those two choices. And if your focus is whether whether my focus, your focus or anyone's focus is domestic, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're focusing on the issues you were talking about in your last segment about mm -hmm. economics and the environment, a lot of the really highly charged issues that are domestic focused. Uh, of course, a lot of domestic issues have international components to them, like the environment and so on. But then Biden's a very easy choice for me as well. Right. I, I agree with his platform much more. I said in the column you know, repeatedly and explicitly how strongly I do disagree with a lot of DeSantis's policies domestically. What my concern is, is I personally think the more important issues facing humanity and the country right now uh, are international and international relations in particular. And the question the column raised was a very specific one. Who should be president from January 2025 to January 2029? And my concerns are that Joe Biden, given his, and I say this respectfully, but I'm trying to be accurate because it's an important subject, given his declining cognitive abilities that I think you agreed with mm -hmm. in your column, the idea that that person would be the commander in chief and our chief uh, executive globally when we're dealing with huge issues, including China, Russia, Ukraine, and so on, you know, four or five years from now, uh, quite alarming to me. And so that was really the driving uh, point behind my article, which, which is certainly right there in the article. So that's why the counterintuitive um, conclusion um, comes from. I think the last quick point is that if it had a different headline, it might have been interpreted different. But as you know, as a columnist, you don't always choose your headlines. Well, OK, so let's explore that a bit. What's what yeah. would what, what would your like if if you had been able to right? like, how would you have summarized it? Well, I think it was it was more anti Biden than it was pro DeSantis. Uh, I I made very clear that the, the end of the column says really what I actually want more than anything would be a younger talented democrat to rise up get the nominee you know become the nominee and that person become president somebody who shares biden's general policy ethos perspective but isn't going to be 86 in four years getting a call at two in the morning because china invaded taiwan instead that person will be 52 or wh whatever the age would be somebody in the prime of their life that that's what i want <laughs> Yeah. So, um, and, and before we, we kind of dig into that argument, I mean, just out of curiosity, you know, we, we just heard from Andy, um, that preliminary results, uh, it looks like, uh, it's, um, right now at least Haley is, uh, is, is second, you know, with, uh, with DeSantis in, uh, in third place. So it, it could, you know, it could be if that gap widens over the course of the night, especially, right, you know, that, um, you know, DeSantis would actually drop out or or even if he doesn't, um, you know, that, you know, so, you know, he's been spending a lot of money and not getting, you know, not getting much back for it. So that could definitely happen. Um, and uh, and even if he doesn't, you know, that, that, you know, Haley could become the main, like, non-Trump candidate. So just, you know, just because all of this has happened, you know, the dynamics of the race has certainly shifted since you wrote the column. Like, oh, you know, yeah. I, I assume you would make the same argument there that the, that like, as, as much as you disagree with her, you know, you'd rather it be Haley than Biden getting the call. Exactly. I actually like Haley more than DeSantis. When I wrote the column, uh, it's, I think I've been about eight months now and it's stunning. I keep refreshing 538, hoping Trump's numbers go down, but uh, they never do. Uh, DeSantis was actually fairly close to Trump. I mean, in retrospect, it seems impossible, but it, the gap wasn't that. And I think H Haley might have been in low single digits. Um, 
since that time, she's come on strong. And I would, you know, I would, I, you're exactly right. I would write that same column that you just essentially uh, find and replace and put Haley in there with a few tweaks. And it'd be the same logic and the same, you know, the same thinking. I, I do like, uh, I do like her actually a little bit more than DeSantis even. Okay. So I know let's talk about why, right? Because, um, you know, I, I can, you know, I can understand uh, the objection uh, about, you know, Biden and, and, you know, cognitive decline. I, I, I actually find it. Um, I mean, I, I wrote something, for Jacobin back in 2020, uh, you know, making, uh, making that point, right. Uh, that, um, that, you know, that there, there, you know, there did seem to be worrying, uh, sides of that. Um, and, and I think that's, that's true. And I, I think it's, I, and I think it's actually frankly kind of amazing that, uh, that I, I keep hearing from, from liberals and Democrats at the same time that a, uh, Donald Trump is this unprecedented threat to democracy and everything is on the line in the election and B um, there should be no discussion whatsoever of, uh, of, of replacing. <laughs> I, I, think I may have written verbatim <laughs> that exact line uh, myself. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that's uh, it's, it's just kind of incredible on its face. Right. So, yeah. so, so, so I, I do, I do understand that. Right. But then, but then the question is, okay. Right. But, but what would be the, you know, like Trump was bad. He did many bad things as, you know, as president. And, you know, even though, you know, I, I suspect that overall, right. I'm, I'm, I'm phoning it from place considerably to the left of, of where you are overall. Right. I, I assume that we at least think that like a lot of what Trump did as president was bad for, for the same reasons uh, or for certainly heavily overlapping reasons. But then the, the the question is, right, uh, whether we're talking about domestic or foreign policy, uh, in in what respects, um, you know, I mean, other than being younger, uh, in what respects uh, would uh, would Haley or uh, or DeSantis uh, be uh, be be different? You know, would 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 they be better? I mean, certainly, if we're talking about uh, democracy, it seems awfully relevant uh, that. Um, you know that that Haley and DeSantis are both on record uh, as saying that they would pardon uh, Trump on on all ninety one uh, indictments uh, that he's facing right now. Uh, that that seems pretty revealing. It also uh, it also seems relevant that you know certainly Ron DeSantis. Um, you know Haley might be a bit better in this respect, but you know but certainly Ron DeSantis as governor of Florida. Uh, where he was, by the way, was a, was a all in, uh, Trump guy. Uh, he, he literally, he did an ad, he did a campaign ad. I think it was when he was running for reelection where he, uh, he was like teaching his like toddler son to say, build the wall. Uh, and, uh, and, and as governor of Florida, he, uh, he, he backed, uh, the, uh, the stop the steal nonsense. He, uh, he said, um, you know, he uh, he actually instituted this like state police uh, task force uh, that was supposed to be to uh, to go after uh, election fraud. But what it actually did was it conducted uh, SWAT raids of people who had registered to vote, even though uh, they weren't allowed to because they had felonies uh, on uh, on their records. You know, none of this certainly indicates a uh, a commitment to to democracy, uh, to to me and and you know and, and I know you said you're kind of, you know, bracketing uh, domestic policy, uh, you know, for for the poor purpose of thinking about this. Although you know, again, if we if we agree that there are like you know catastrophic uh, levels of inequality, then as as much as I you know as much as sort of Biden, what I would see as Biden's you know tepid. Uh, centrism is bad, uh, then certainly, um, certainly this kind of, you know, I mean, the, a lot of what I think was bad that happened under Trump was this, this kind of four year orgy of, of deregulation and union busted and tax cuts for rich people, uh, that would certainly happen under either, under either Haley or DeSantis. 
Um, and 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 if we're and even on, on foreign policy, uh, these these people are um, are both extremely hawkish. Uh, the you know, DeSantis in keeping with his long stand, you know, as far as, I mean, I know I would assume that DeSantis is somebody who works for him, whose job is just to scroll right wing Twitter all day and figure out, you know, what they're mad about. So he could do some sort of press conference or initiative, you know, to uh, show what he's doing about it. My favorite example, of this was when there was, a, you know, that week when we were all doing culture war over gas stoves and DeSantis announced that he was going to have a uh, tax break for buying gas stoves in Florida, even though it's Florida, there are like hardly any gas lines. Uh, as part of that, there was a point, you know, he, he had like, he, he has this like obsession with Confucius institutes uh, that are, you know, sponsored by, by China and how we need to get rid of these. And he, he's always talking about them, you know, the like fighting the influence of the Chinese communist party, uh, which, you know, surely would have been taking over Florida uh, in his, uh, in his absence. Uh, Nikki Haley, I mean, at, at one of the last, um, the, uh, you know, one of the debates in uh, the one that was immediately after um October 7th, uh, you know, certainly sounded to me like she wanted to go to war with Iran. Right. You know, so uh, these these are people who are seem pretty belligerent on uh, on on foreign policy uh, to, to me. Right. And, and where, you know, Trump, uh, I think, was a severely mixed bag. Uh, he uh, he had, um, you know, he you know, he assassinated Soleimani, for example, he brought us very close to the brink of war with Iran, but then he kind of, you know, I don't know, had a, had a mood swing or, you know, he watched Tucker Carlson and Tucker said not to, and he, and he decided not to, right. Which is, it's not great, right? Like there's, there's nothing about that description that I like, or that makes That's me want Trump, Trump to be president. Again. But, but, but also, concerning. okay. But like, is somebody who's just sort of consistently hawkish and belligerent better than that? And if so, why? Yeah. Well, you, let me just say that. I know I've laid out a bunch of stuff. So if you yeah. want to go back to earlier parts, feel free to address any yeah. part of that. Yeah. I think a couple thoughts. Number one, you're saying a lot of things I totally agree with. Um, I, and I, and I think, unfortunately, I'm very frustrated about this for our country. I think our choices here are really bad. We have really awful choices here. It's a very narrow field at this point. It's almost for sure at this point going to be Biden and Trump. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a real problem for our country. And and all of the things that you're saying about DeSantis and and Haley, um, you know, I might quibble at the degree to which you're expressing them or the margins, but yeah, I agree with you. And there's no doubt they've got people scrolling right wing Twitter and that's, you know, that's how they're coming up with their headlines. Uh, and they're, you know, the, the things that they're, they're, they're stump speeches and all of that. Um, I think on foreign policy, I, and, and, and so the domestic thing versus foreign policy, here's how I think about it. I think that domestically there's, there's big differences, whether you've got a Biden or a Haley, right? Let's just use those two for this example. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be taxing people who make a million dollars at 36%? or 28%. It's meaningful, right? But that's about the range. You, we've, a lot of it depends on who wins the House, who wins the Senate, right? What the composition of Congress looks like. Um, but a lot of these issues are, are cabined in in ways that are, they're very important. And again, if your focus po politically is domestic, that's where the battles are. But if you zoom out and you compare how the United States and China's relationship over the next decade evolves. And you compare that to 36% for people making a million dollars or 28%. It's much, much more important that we get China right. And that goes back to the 2 a.m. phone call in late 2027 when China's invaded Taiwan and they accidentally or maybe on purpose blew up two of our Navy ships. I don't want Joe Biden waking up, getting that phone call at 86 years old and making the decision of what we do in response to that. I want somebody who is intelligent, clear thinking, full of vigor. I want somebody like Biden was 30 years ago or even 15 years ago, uh, maybe even 10. Um, 
I think it's really important. And, and this goes to your point about are Haley and DeSantis just belligerent hawks? So they would just say nuke China and it would be even worse than Biden not knowing what to do. Um, and I'm, you know, I don't, I don't mean to be critical of Biden. When I'm his age, I'll probably be much, much worse. Uh, but I'm trying to be accurate again because of how important it is. I personally, and I think this could be really where the debate could be really sort of targeted and focused about, about who's right and who's wrong. I don't think Haley and I don't think DeSantis are, are MAGA zealot idiots. I think Trump is. Trump's obviously very talented politically. But I think Haley and DeSantis are playing the hand they have to play right now in terms of strolling, trolling Twitter. I think they are true conservatives. I strongly disagree with a huge number of their policies, the overwhelming majority of their policies. But I don't think when it comes to issues where the, the role of the president and the commander in chief is just to get to the right answer and handle a complicated flashpoint the right way, I don't think they're going to be the DeSantis in that commercial. I don't think Haley's just going to say, you know, go nuke Iran because, you know, for no reason. I think they'll have serious people and they'll make serious judgments in that space. They'll do lots of harm domestically. They'll say lots of stupid things. They'll do lots of damage to lots of people that you and I want to protect. Uh, but it's cabined in, as in the examples I gave, to me, it's a fairly narrow range. When you compare it to what do we do with Russia in 2032? You know, what does that look like? And, and who is the leader, the, the chief executive harmonizing advice and making decisions? And the idea that Joe Biden four years from now is that person is very alarming. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I wanted to, to, uh, to give you a minute on that. Cause I know I threw a lot at you, but, yeah. um, but, uh, but, but I want to go back to something that you said a minute ago about, uh, how you didn't think that, you know, Haley or DeSantis, uh, you know, we're like really mega types, even if DeSantis at one point thought it was advantageous to present himself that way. Uh, and, and they were, you know, true conservatives and, you know, there are lots of things that you disagree with conservatives on, but you do still think that's better. And, and I think in a, in a sense that that might actually be really cut to the core of the disagreement that uh, in other words, like, is, you know, Trump's, um, you know, is MAGA, right, this, this, this new thing, right, that's like, that's, that's like really substantially, you know, different, right, that, um, or, uh, or is it, um, you know, a branded exercise that's, you know, that's, that's certainly, um, you know, that's certainly attached to an individual who has, you know, numerous flaws we don't need to waste time getting into, right, that, uh, that at the sort of, core of of what he actually do right is is maybe you know not that different right so uh in other words um you know if you think about what is you know allegedly you know supposed to to make uh trump different from previous republicans uh that you know what, what was supposed to you know to make the the mega project differently you know go back to what he he said right in, in 2016 uh that was mostly about things that he didn't actually do right that uh that he he said he was going to um you know he went to you know lordstown ohio and told people to uh that he was going to bring the uh the factory you know the uh the like steel plants back you know uh he uh, he said, uh, he said on the campaign that, you know, that he wasn't going to, you know, he wasn't going to touch, uh, it, you know, entitlement programs, uh, which of course, you know, he, he actually, you know, uh, certainly tried to at various points to cut Medicaid and, you know, and, and food stamps, um, you know, so that, you know, like the stuff, the, the domestic populism certainly, right. Is, uh, is what was supposed to, uh, is something that was supposed to be importantly different, you know, from other Republicans and earlier Republicans and on the, uh, on the foreign policy end, uh, it was, um, you know, it was 
isolationism allegedly right you know that 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 he he wasn't an interventionist he you know he criticized the the iraq war to to jeb uh, to jeb bush and you know that you know i think as we discussed he was incredibly inconsistent about uh in uh in in office but you know that's the that's the stuff that was you know like like there was a lot of there was a lot of stuff that was supposed to be different which was mostly would have been good if it was serious right that wasn't different and then there was a lot in practice that was that was the same right i mean that they that uh that what did you know trump's big domestic co- you know policy accomplishment was a tax cut for rich people you know trump uh you know like His judges were all the same people that anyone else would have yeah it was for the same list provide you know that for the federalist society or whatever that i'm sure Absolutely. that i'm sure yeah. A press a president Rubio uh would yeah. have would have been using if he'd won the primaries. Uh I'm agreeing with everything you're saying, Ben. So so, <laughs> so okay. So well I so in that case, right? Like yeah. th- th- but this all goes to the distinction that you're drawing about uh about like real conservatives and and, and MAGA, right? So so we've kind of agreed that it's it's not on those it's not on policy, right? So 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 what so what is the so what is the core of the distinction that you see if there's this like important distinction between true conservatives and mega so uh so Haley and DeSantis are better than Trump because true conservatives are better than mega like like, like what, what what's the wh- what's that line about so so I, I may I may have misspoke I think sure. DeSantis and Haley certainly embrace MAGA yeah. lots of their policies will they have to there's no mm-hmm. way you could show up if you didn't and I think one of our biggest problems as a country, and frankly, the underlying reason we're dealing with a lot of the things you and I are talking about is very widespread irrationality and dysfunction in the populace, MAGA being you know, the primary example of that. That's not going away. Okay. And if, if Haley were to be president, you better believe she's making America great again in every speech. And so, so, so it's not like she's going to waltz in there and be Jeb Bush, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of um, inconsistency that's going to come from yeah. if, if, if any of them were elected. Mm-hmm. The, the key difference for me, I think the most striking example to illustrate it is just that 2 a.m. phone call four years from now. And, and I think Trump, if he gets that phone call, first of all, he'll be 80 or something. Mm-hmm. The second the, he hears what's happening, he'll be thinking, well, what, what's my I'm going to just tweet something to Chairman Z that's going to piss him off. And I don't even, you know, it, he'll be Trump. OK, mm-hmm. and we, I'm, I'm very alarmed about that coming back. His brand of me first sort of belligerent, irrational diplomacy, that would be horrible for the country. Um, I think that 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 Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, my sense, and we'll learn if they doesn't look like it's going to happen, but you don't know until they're in office. But oh. my sense is they would take it seriously. They would have they would have a cabinet of serious people. And in that sense, it would be traditional people. Robert Gates, for example, uh-huh. was defense secretary for uh, George W. Bush and Obama. Uh-huh. And I think it's likely somebody in that mold would be involved with either DeSantis or Haley and offer rational. And that would be somebody I disagreed with on lots of their conservative philosophical questions about tax codes and labor unions and things like that. But they would assess the situation rationally and 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 we would behave in a way where we maximized our, our likelihood that we didn't get ensnarled in a a huge conflict or we handled it the right way. And that, that leads me, if I may, to a question for you. Sure. So my column made the point that we're we're looking at least worst options. And I chose DeSantis compared to eight months ago. And now I'm saying I choose him and Haley. over Uh I don't think you can, can rebut or refute that argument unless you clearly articulate why biden is better yeah and your article i'm almost done your article didn't sure. do, i liked your article it was well written but i didn't think your article actually affirmatively did that and so what happens in your opinion in 2027 when biden gets that phone call that's mm-hmm. better 
than Nikki Haley. Why? Right. Okay. So, um, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's complicated by the fact that, um, that, you know, foreign policy is where, uh, you know, lesser evil arguments are often at their least clear, uh, cause, uh, because, um, some of the same continuity that you just talked about, right. With your example about Robert Gates, yeah. um, that, you know, you have, uh, you have, uh, you know, you tend to have trends in, uh, the foreign policy establishment, which is the part of the American state that's the most insulated from public opinion, um, that, um, that, you know, that kind of wax away over time. And, and, you know, I mean, Biden has, has certainly done things that, you know, that horrify me in, uh, in, you know, uh, obvi- most obviously Gaza. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I, I think that the, the reason, uh, that, uh, that I would be at the very least, uh, unconvinced, uh, that it would be better, right. For, uh, for Haley to, uh, to get that phone call, um, is that, uh, is that the, you know, her, uh, everything that I've heard from her on foreign policy in this campaign. I mean, again, even if, you know, even if we're doing this in a way that, you know, that all we're interested in is, is the reaction to foreign policy crises, which is certainly not all that's For at sure. stake. Right. Well, but even if that's all just an example, that's, sure, yeah. sure. That's fine. Right. You know, even if that's all that we're interested in for the moment, for the purpose of considering that example, uh, then, uh, then I would say, well, I would look at everything, you know, everything that Nikki Haley has expressed about foreign policy over the course of this, this campaign, which I've consistently, uh, found, uh, extremely alarming, right. You know, when she, uh, you know, when she, she seems to want to escalate tensions, uh, with, you know, with, with China, uh, you know, a lot of Republicans are critical of Biden's Ukraine policy, but sort of from, you know, uh, you know, oftentimes they'll say, well, we should like cool off on that to focus on like the real enemy, which is China, uh, you know, which I'm not crazy about either, you know, but Nikki Haley seems to want to do both. Uh, she certainly sounds very belligerent about Iran and the sort of biggest point that, that I would make about, about all of this, right. Is that, um, you know, if we're, if we're thinking about this in a broader sense, um, and, you know, and if we're, you know, the sort of larger ideological point I tried to make in, in my response to Jacobin is, you know, to what extent are we thinking about elections and choices between politicians uh, as sort of uh, decisions about who's the most, um, you know, com- you know, technically competent person, and to what extent are we thinking about these clashes of ideology or interests? Uh, and I wouldn't go so far as to say that's not at all the first thing, right? I do take what you're saying seriously on that, uh, but of course, uh, competence is good when people are competently pursuing doing good things and uh can you, you want your bad. enemies to be uh incompetent yeah it could actually be bad if they're competently pursuing bad it, things it's gotta all line up 100 so, percent. yeah i I've, i would argue is as much of you know what you could like desantis when courts aren't throwing it out as has been yeah. pretty effective in getting to getting things in through. Well, even when courts do throw it out and sometimes that corresponds with overall effectiveness because it means you're leaning into things and but sure but I, to- but I, to- I, totally right so, so, so let, yeah. let me just say let me just say this though right so to that point, right, as it applies to foreign policy, uh, given the very belligerent, very, very neocon things that I often uh, hear Haley say, what I immediately think is, look, uh, did, did, did Trump do plenty of things in foreign policy that I, I think are horrible over the course of his four years as president? He did, right? But if I were to say, uh, you know, which president in uh the 21st century has done the most damage in uh in that regard for, for me it wouldn't be a contest uh that would be george w bush who was uh 54 years old when he was elected uh no uh no age uh no age worry there at all right uh you know uh and uh and who was um who was certainly surrounded 
by the sort of people who had you know, been in previous Republican administrations. Some cases like his defense secretary, Robert Gates, you mentioned, would then well, serve Gates under- came in at the end and cleaned up more than uh, he wasn't behind that. Okay, he, he but, behind. you know, it's nevertheless true, right, that, uh, that, that George W. Bush, I mean, if you're talking about who would no, scare us, you know, I, I, I think I that's mean, a very valid point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this so is, let me this, just ask this. So, we, we, so then we got let's 20, 20 years of war in Afghanistan. We yeah. got uh, an absolutely yeah. disastrous invasion of Iraq, punched a hole in the Middle East. We got the drone war and indefinite detention and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, 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 I will, I will give you the last word on this, but I mean, this, that, that would, that would be, that would be why. I would I, I that would be why I I think that I would um, perhaps you know gun to the head right I mean I I I live in California it doesn't matter who I vote for but you know gun to the head I would uh, I would take uh, I would take um, you know I would take Biden uh, over over Nikki Haley there uh, you know I think the example of the far greater damage that George W Bush did than Trump in foreign policy would be would be my go-to there and then as as i said i'll i'll give you the last word on this yeah and, and i don't know if we have time restrictions and i should be talking quickly or or uh, or not let me know if we do but um i i think those are, those are all good points and make sense um to me um i don't put a lot of weight into campaign trail rhetoric about foreign policy it does not tend to correspond strongly with what what actually happens, uh, it, it and and so it's you need to pay attention. It's all you really have to go on in in a lot of ways. But I, I would be shocked if, uh, you know, if Haley were to be president, which again, we're, this is so hypothetical at this point, given the, the way things have transpired in the last eight months. I, I would be surprised if it just sort of mirrored or even closely, you know, mildly resembled, you know, the things she's saying on the trail. Um, but I would I would love to just hear. So what is very good criticisms of DeSantis, very good criticisms of, De, of Haley. Great point about Bush not being 86 and and very, very cognitively impaired is not sufficient to be good in foreign policy. You also have to be other things and not, you know, George W. Bush was not uh, too old. Uh, and, and, and you're right. He did very damaging things in the war in Iraq you know, in retrospect was a unbelievable disaster, but, but I, but let's shift just to Biden. What does that 2 a.m. phone call look like in 2027? Just what, because in order to prove he's better, you've got to explain well, this side. I, what, what does that look like and why are, and why is it better? And, and I'm not trying to sure. repeat the same question, but I'd like to hear you just. Yeah, right. right. Like, look, I, I, I think I, tried to lay it out earlier uh i'll uh i'll, I'll rephrase maybe uh this yeah. time but um you know i i think um you know obviously i'm in the uh uncomfortable position of defending somebody i'm extremely critical of about this stuff but uh yeah. but uh but i you know i would say at the very least right that uh that we we have this isn't entirely hypothetical right we uh, we had uh, the invasion of uh, of Ukraine under uh, under Biden, and uh, and while of course he hasn't done you know anything like the kind of you know de-escalation and you know moves towards diplomatic settlement that I would have liked, um, I I certainly don't see any indication. I mean, of course you're right that you know campaign trail rhetoric can can diverge from what people do, but you're also right that it's all we have to go on for somebody who doesn't uh you know doesn't have a record that can contradict it yet. Uh that the uh that I uh, certainly don't see any indication that Nikki Haley would have and um uh, and you know there was actually quite a bit of pressure for you know for Biden to uh lots of people were talking about like setting up a no-fly zone and you know shooting down uh Russian planes over uh over Ukraine, uh which you know, which he at least uh he at least didn't do, right? It's uh that's a that's a pretty minimal bar, right? You know, but uh but he cleared it. Uh and and you know, so to me, right, the the question is what's the reason to uh to think that Haley uh, would have uh, would have done something, you know, 
would have been better, right? And and if and if it's and if the only reason that I'm I'm here it is just that um, you know that that she's she's younger and you know less likely to get confused at the moment or something, uh, then I, I I suppose, right? But like I have, um, but you know I I think that um, I I think that uh, that the you know if we sort of agree that George W. Bush, when he was, when he was, you know, as, uh, when he was 54, right. The age he was when he was elected, uh, was, um, uh, you know, was not right. Somebody who you would, you would rather get that phone call than, than, than Biden. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure why Nikki, you know, Nikki Haley would, um, would be better. Right. Like, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't see, you know, that the, uh, I mean, unless, you know, you think that in a moment of, you know, extreme senility, right, you know, uh, Biden is just going to say something wild, which, you know, and, and you know, get the 25th Amendment invoked on him, I guess, uh, then, um, then it doesn't, it seems like the questions about what people's actual preferences are, right, you know, what their, what their foreign policy instincts are, is going to be more relevant to me than, than what their, um, than, uh, than, than how, you know, than how old, uh, than how old they are. I mean, as, as, you know, as much as, you know, as much as also maybe to, to end this on a, uh, conciliatory note right something that we something that we do agree on right yeah. i it, it's uh it's absolutely <laughs> insane that the uh democrats have insisted that this this guy who who is um uh, you know unprecedentedly old uh you know and you know and also has extremely bad poll numbers and 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 That's right that, that this that this yeah. person has to be has to be the nominee uh and yeah. and in fact it's so important that he be the nominee that we're you know that like the the primary voters shouldn't even really have a choice uh about it like all of that is all of that is, is completely nuts none of it makes me want nikki haley to be president you know but uh but yeah. you know but 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 i do agree with the premise that it's it's a it's a totally indefensible decision yeah I don't want her to be president either. I want Gavin Newsom to run, or you speaking of California, uh, or someone like that. But uh, well, we'll, 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 see how, we'll see how things play out over the next. Uh, well, at uh, some point, we'll, uh, some point you can come back out. We can have an argument about Gavin Newsom. But yeah. in any case, uh, yeah. uh, appreciate it, uh, Will. So uh, once again, uh, the. Um, the op-ed was Democrats' case for DeSantis. The uh, book is How America Works and Why It Doesn't, A Brief Guide to the U.S. Political System. Uh, thanks for coming down. Thanks very much, Ben. Lots of fun. Really appreciate your time and uh, lots, of good, uh, lots of good points. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, now we are joined by returning champion, um, a um, a Ben uh uh editor from Damage Magazine, uh author of uh Quick Fixes, uh which uh we were talking about uh last time he was on the podcast. Uh Ben Fong, uh and um we uh are talking about uh his brand new uh brand new limited series podcast organizing the unorganized so uh how are you doing today ben good good thanks so much for having me and i'm glad that you included the most important part of my introduction first which is that i'm a ben a brother in benness glad to be it's, here exactly uh <laughs> well uh well yeah you uh you sent us uh you sent us a few um clips uh from uh from for the show so i'm just gonna play one of these to set up the conversation all right there are great influences abroad in the land and the minds of men in all walks of life are disturbed we are all disturbed by reason of the changes and the hazards in our economic situation and as regards our own political security there are forces at work in this country that would wipe out, if they could, the labor movement of America, 
just as it was wiped out in Germany or just as it was wiped out in Italy. It is our belief that the best security against that menace and against that trend and against that tendency is a more comprehensive and more powerful labor movement. It is our conviction that the establishment of industrial unionism involves real recovery and reform, that shorter hours of work and re-employment of the unemployed are dependent upon its success, that it will secure a living wage for all and not profits for the privileged few, that it offers the only way to emancipation from industrial autocracy to economic and political freedom to those who work by hand or brain. Yeah, so um, give us some uh, give us some context there for what we were just uh, just listening to, and uh, you know, and and just in a. Um, which is, you know, which is kind of a remarkable clip in some ways. If you sort of think about like old, like, I don't know, um, I'm too TV brand, you know, what I, th- what I, you know, what I think of like, um, you know, certain kind of old timey labor leader, you know, my, uh, you know, my head goes to, uh, Krusty the clown interviewing George Meany, uh, <laughs> you know, as their labor crisis in America. And that's uh, certainly very different, you know, from, uh, from the, the tenor of that. So, uh, so yeah, tell, tell me about that and, and tell me, you know, more generally about what you're doing with this podcast. Sure. So that was John L. Lewis. Uh, he was the founder of the CIO. He founded the CIO along with uh, eight to 10 other labor leaders uh, out of the American Federation of Labor. And uh, the CIO, in case your listeners and uh, viewers don't know, it was the Congress of Industrial Organizations. It was a labor federation that existed from 1935 to 1955. And it is the federation that we associate with the organization of um, the mass production industries in America. So um, steel, rubber, auto, electrical manufacturing, all of these things before the 30s were unorganized. They were non-union. And um, in the space of a very short amount of time, just a space of a few years, many of these industries became organized and some became almost uh, fully organized. So it was a great uh, achievement in labor relations, uh, and the CIO would go on to grow through the war years and finally remerge with the American Federation of Labor in 1955 to form the AFL-CIO, which still exists today. Um, that clip was from uh, the mid-30s. Uh, I'm you know, very happy to be including in the podcast not only interviews with a lot of different labor historians, in fact, that's what takes up the bulk of the podcast, um, but also archival clips and songs and whatnot. And that clip uh, is from, I believe, the Wisconsin Historical Society. They've got seven-inch aluminum discs that they helped me digitize. And, um, and that's Lewis speaking about the imminent threat of fascism. Um, and, you know, Lewis himself was generally recognized to be a kind of autocratic union leader in the 1920s. Um, he stayed that way, really. Uh, but he, you know, oversaw a declining union in the 1920s, and he was blamed for a lot of different things uh, at, at that point. And then in the 30s, he becomes, uh, he's got this, you know, remarkable transformation. He becomes the voice of of labor in America, really. And, um, you know, people have put forward different theories as to why that is exactly. But one of the reasons is that he felt that what was going on in Germany and what was going on in Italy, as he referenced in that clip, could happen in America too. And he thought the best safeguard against fascism was a strong labor movement. That was the case he was making in that radio address. Um, There's other reasons that he invested in the CIO, but that's the the key one he offers in that clip. Yeah. And I mean, maybe it's it's worth, you know, kind of taking a, a step back a little bit and talking about both kind of, um, you know, what the, the CIO was right why the congress of industrial organizations uh split off from the american federation of labor in the first place right you know what what it was trying to do and and maybe and maybe also if you wanted to kind of speak to how that uh relates to why you thought this would be like a you know interesting or important you know story to tell right now in this podcast 
Yeah, maybe I'll speak to that second question first. Um, there are a lot of different moments of labor upsurge in America. You know, you got the Knights of Labor in 1886 uh, when this fledgling organization, because of victory in this rail strike, it grows to, you know, some 700,000 members almost overnight. It quickly disappears. Um, you've got a lot of organizing around the turn of the century through the American Federation of Labor. Um, you've got uh, 1919, a big seal strike then. Um, you know, all these different moments of labor upsurge. But but really, there's only one time in American history when millions of private sector workers joined the labor movement and stayed in the labor movement as well. And that's the CIO moment. And I think that uh, if we're looking for a model for that today, something that we obviously want to happen today for millions of private sector workers to join the labor movement, and not only that, but stay in the labor movement and provide the stability that the labor movement provides, um, that's the that's the model. That's the model to look to for inspiration. Um as far as the genesis of the CIO goes, so before the CIO came along, um, the dominant labor federation in America was the American Federation of Labor. And, um, you know, there are other uh, uh, organizations, there's the IWW, there's again the Knights of Labor, um, but the American Federation uh, of, of Labor was really seen as um, the predominant labor institution in America for about 50 years. Um, it was very devoted to what we call a craft model of organizing, which is to say that they privileged workers' skill in the labor market, right? And so provided you had a certain skill that was somewhat irreplaceable or at least was was valued in such a way that offered leverage within the market, um, they wanted to organize you. So uh, carpenters, for instance, um, uh, electrical workers, um, uh, you know, puddlers and rollers, sort of like certain skilled steel people, tool and die makers in in auto. Um, these were the people that that um, the AFL privileged that they wanted to organize, and everyone else they said it just wasn't worth it. Right at a certain point in history, this model actually had some purchase. Right before you know, into the like late nineteenth century, before the you know the rapid industrialization and before mass production really became the norm in America. It made a certain sense to use the kind of um, power that, uh, sir, again, a certain privileged set of workers had in the in the labor market, to organize them. By the mid '30s, it made no sense whatsoever. Right, you had these enormous factories, a whole bunch of workers centralized in uh, in mass production facilities, and the AFL was totally un uninterested in organizing them on a mass basis, except to hive them off into the different jurisdictions of their member unions, and to Lewis to people like Sidney Hillman in the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, to David Dubinsky in the Garment Workers Union, they said, this doesn't make any sense, right? Why are we gonna go into a factory and hive off these workers into 17 different unions? We need a, a wall, to, what we call today, a wall-to-wall -wall union of all the, the workers in a factory, and we need to get them in now because this was you know, in the wake of the Great Depression. They were really clamoring for, for unions. They were clamoring for union recognition. And Lewis, Hillman, Dubinsky, a few other leaders within the AFL, they said, now's the moment. They, they try to do it the, the right way, uh, you know, by passing resolutions in committee at different conventions for a long time. They got nowhere. And finally, after the November 1935 convention, uh, they, they strike out on their own. John Lewis, you know, as the reports go, he jumped over a row of chairs on the floor of the convention to punch out the carpenter's president. And that sort of symbolized the break. He said, okay, Nick, th this is the moment. And a month later, they formed, uh, they opened the first office of the CIO. Wow. Uh, yeah, so um, I actually did not know that story. I love that. Uh, that's um, that's great. Uh, all right, so, uh, so yeah, we do have... Uh, you know, a couple of clips for uh, people that you uh, you just mentioned. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's play Hillman. Organized labor's demands meet the needs of the American people. They are demands which have grown out of experience with the ills of mass production economy. They are demands which will we believe, if granted, bring security, abundance, and self-respect to the American people. In a mass production age, there must be sufficient purchasing power in the country to consume that which we produce. Lack of purchasing power 
spells economic stagnation, unemployment, and ultimately national bankruptcy. Our demand for the minimum wage is essential so that the American people may be guaranteed at least a minimum amount of purchasing power. Our demand for the right to organize and bargain collectively is so obviously fair and essential that it appears foolish to argue that point before any intelligent American audience. Manufacturers organize into powerful associations. Why deny American labor that very right? The right of every free citizen. People of this country, if they choose, may follow an irresponsible leadership, a leadership that has never learned the need for self-control in the interest of the general good. And if they choose that cause, it is my conviction that disaster is ahead of us. On the other hand, they may, as I hope they will, choose the road of planning for security and plenty for all. A ray of hope came to the country since the Roosevelt administration has attempted to bring order out of chaos. The American people want an opportunity to earn for themselves a decent standard of living. They want security, and they are entitled to it. I believe that the program labor has to offer will bring a solution which will be the answer to our needs. Surely with our resources and ingenuity, we can abolish poverty in the midst of plenty. Yeah, so I mean, I think this uh, actually maybe pairs with the Lewis one uh, that we started with in an interesting way and, you know, maybe gives us a little bit of a sense of uh, the you know, political, uh, alliances that, uh, that, you know, that, that came out of this, right. You know, so, um, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, I, I do definitely want to, want to hear about that, about the, the sort of, the sort of context for, you know, for what in particular, uh, he's, you know, he's saying here and, you know, and, and the, the relationship between this, you know, these new militant unions and, you know, the, uh, the Roosevelt administration, but, um, uh, but, uh, but first, I mean, just just Hillman, like as as a as a guy, right? I mean, like like who uh, you know, like who is this? Yes, yeah, uh, Sidney Hillman is generally recognized to be the only other power center within the early CIO, other than Lewis. Um, Lewis and the mine workers are really the dominant force. They bring the treasury, they bring uh, the experience, the organizing experience, the contract negotiation experience. Um, but Hillman uh, also has a lot of that as well, albeit in a smaller and more segmented industry. It was primarily, you know, Jewish and Italian immigrants that he was representing through the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. And, um, uh, you know, Hillman is uh, in, in many ways uh, a great counterbalance to Lewis. Lewis, despite the fact that he broke from the AFL, really kind of retained uh, an a AFL, AFL sensibilities, right? He was skeptical of being too involved in politics. He saw a certain political opportunity with Roosevelt, but he never grows that close to Roosevelt. And actually in 1940, he ends up endorsing Wendell Wilkie and breaks with the CIO. So that's a sort of public, public disagreement and public split later on. Um, whereas Hillman understands, I think, much more acutely the nature of the political moment he sees that tying the CIO's fate to Roosevelt was a good thing, that despite the fact that Roosevelt was a liberal in essence, um, he wouldn't send in the guns at the right moment. And, you know, if you're a labor leader, that's a, that's a really important thing. Not that you need politicians to necessarily be on your side, but just that they would neutralize that typical government corporate alliance it's a huge thing and i think that lewis and hillman saw that together in the early years and hillman hillman thought uh that they needed to remain allied to the democratic party in order to sort of see the cio's mission through and that definitely worked out in the war effort because of people like sydney hillman uh labor leaders were assigned to the war labor board and there was some influence of organized labor over the war production effort um 
not exactly tripartite tripartite negotiations. They gave up a lot in the process, but um, that willingness to work within the existing structures and to buy all into the, the Democratic Party that did result in you know huge victories in 1941. Ford was finally organized. The little steel companies were finally organized, and so you know it's you you could say it's a kind of Faustian bargain that Hillman was engaged in, right? He like he understood that unions could grow by essentially, you know, giving in to being a junior partner in the Democratic Party and to going all in on the war effort. Uh, Lewis disagreed with that. Um, but of course, you know, during the war effort, the CIO bureaucratized and a lot of the, uh, the, the, the constitutional faults of organized labor really sort of settled in at that, at that moment. So I think he was, he was, uh, Hillman in short was just a much more political animal than, than Lewis. He really, he really saw himself as a, a New Deal Democrat devoted to a kind of global social democracy, whereas Lewis was much more just about union power, power within his own union. Yeah, and I mean that that point about um, you know the obvious, you know whatever you think about the long term consequences of that, um, you know decision to you know become a junior partner in the Democratic Party and the way that that played out over the subsequent decades, you know that that point about. Um, you know, what did somebody like FDR, who at least wasn't going to, uh, you know, send in the guns, uh, is, you know, is really worth circling and underlining because, I mean, this is, you know, the 1930s, uh, people, you know, striking workers were like killed during strikes all the time, right? I mean, that, that, was, a, that was a regular event. You know, I remember, um, you know, uh, many years ago reading uh, Farrell Dobbs's book, uh, Teams to Rebellion, you know, where he talks about this, you know, and sort of it's like, yeah, you just always read the reports like, oh, yeah, you know, three three workers, you know, died during that strike, you know, after, you know, after clashes, you know, a few new busters, et cetera. And that's, uh, that's even just normal strikes, never mind what some of these uh, new, more militant CIO unions, you know, were, were, were doing, which was uh, actually, you know, temporarily seizing the means of production, you know, doing, doing, uh, doing, doing sit down strikes, you know, in, in sort of direct, uh, contravention of, you know, uh, the owner's property rights. Yeah. I mean, really the history of the American labor movement, uh, up until the CIO moment is militancy being met with pretty brutal repression and violence. That's the norm. That's, that's really what, um, heads of corporations throughout American history expected. They expect that that's what they expected from politicians, that at the right moment, they would uh, be on the side of repression. And the, the, you know, this is not to take away from the mm -hmm. militancy of the, uh, you know, the rank and file organization, what happened in, you know, Flint, for instance, the most, the most famous confrontation of the, of the uh, early ascendant period of the CIO, was ingenious, right? They understood how to do strategic disruption. They did it extremely well. But if Governor Frank Murphy and Francis Perkins and FDR had decided that the National Guard was going to go in, it could have ended very differently. And it was really only once it became clear to GM that Murphy, FDR, Perkins, they were not going to let that happen. That's really when they came to the table. So it was it was the militancy, but militancy expressed within a certain set of political conditions that allowed it to be successful. Right, which was definitely a live issue. I mean, I know uh, uh, FDR's uh, original vice president, right, Captain, uh, you know, Cactus Jack uh, Garner, uh, was like outraged uh, that the the military, you know, wasn't being sent in to uh, to to crush uh, the set down strikes, and you know, saw this as like a just you know extremely disturbing sign of uh, of creeping communism, uh, essentially. Yeah. Um, I think they I think they also rightly saw that um, they I, I I think that they didn't want the cat to get out of the bag. They they saw something inspiring there, and if they could crush it, it would go away. But in the wake of the victory at Flint, you saw this wave of sit-down strikes, and it was really unprecedented and kind of amazing. And like in, in, a, in a whole bunch of different industries, right after um, the the GM sit-down, after they they win in Flint and other places, uh, Chrysler has a similar sit-down. And whereas in Flint you had you know three four thousand workers uh, really in charge right it wasn't the whole the whole workforce it was really a vanguard of workers that were occupying the factories 
in Chrysler, you had 25, 30,000 workers sitting down. I mean, it was a massive sit down by comparison. And I think that they saw that something had been unleashed and it really took, again, the return of bloody repression to end the sit down wave. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think we have a, um, I think this is uh, the clip that starts out somebody talking about this, the milkman uh, one. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is Ruth Milkman. She's a professor of sociology at the CUNY Graduate Center. And this is uh, her speaking about, uh, yeah, just the, what, what was inspiring about the factory occupations. Factory occupations. You know what? What better way to disrupt production than to just take over the building? In the case of the Flint strike, it went on for a few months that they occupied those factories. That was not the only tactic, of course, but that was the most publicly visible one. And when they won, most observers, workers and other people attributed the victory to the sit down strike. We could argue about whether that was really the key thing. But that was certainly how the optic, that's how it looked to everybody. And there was this epidemic, basically, of sit-down strikes thereafter, all over the place, including like uh, retail stores in Detroit. There's this famous Woolworths strike where the clerks are sitting on the counter and occupying the store. And so that it just inspired copycat organizing all over the place. Why was it so inspiring? I mean, you know, it's a pretty appealing idea if you're an a worker who's treated terribly by your employer every day that you can just take over the whole enterprise and win rights by doing so. I mean, I guess I think it's as simple as that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I should say that um, most of the podcast is that, so I narrate it minimally, but it's mostly interviews with people like people like Ruth, other labor historians and experts. Uh, it's really a recounting of the story of the CIO through the voices of labor historians. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I think, you know, maybe to, um, you know, connect a couple of dots, right. You know, it, it is, you know, worth thinking about, you know, at the beginning of the show, we were talking about sort of, uh, arguments about, you know, cultural shifts in the United States over the, you know, the course of the last several decades that are often conducted in this way that uh, leaves out material conditions that, you know, pretends, uh, you know, that um, ignores, for example, the fact that, you know, that the, the sort of 1950s idol of the, you know, uh, the, you know, the stay at home mom and, you know, white picket fence and all that stuff to the extent that that was a real thing for uh, even many working class people was, uh, you know, uh, because of of incomes uh, that could uh, that that could support that, uh, and uh, and it is you know really worth reflecting on the fact that you know that that to the extent that you know that a lot of people certainly in you know in places like you know Michigan where I grew up uh, you know could um, you know Ohio you know Youngstown you know where my mom's from. Uh, you know, places that, you know, are around a lot of heavy industry to the extent that there were a lot of, uh, of working class people who, you know, whatever we think of the way it all plays out culturally could have, uh, that kind of decent standard of living, uh, you know, uh, working, um, you know, working at, uh, at, you know, auto plants or steel mills, uh, that, that is to a great extent downstream of, uh, this, this labor uprising, in, uh, in in the 1930s, and you know the the unions that uh, that that were built then, you know, so uh, this this seems um, yeah, this this seems like incredibly valuable uh, history and and very uh, you know and very timely. Uh, so uh, where can uh, where can people? So again, it's called organized the unorganized. Uh, where can people find this? It's on the uh, Jackman Radio podcast uh, feed. Uh, it's also at soundcloud.com slash organize the unorganized. That's where I'm keeping all the episodes and the show notes and everything. Um, yeah, but it's also, yeah, like I said, on the Jackman feed. Nice. All right. Uh, well, uh, how, how far are you into it right now? Uh, we just uh, have episode one. Episodes two, episode two is coming out tomorrow. Uh, the clips that, that were actually just played are from episode two and three. So these are the this is the the, the premiere of those clips tonight. 
outstanding. Well, this is a good time to start listening. Uh, so again, limited series podcast, uh, the Jacobin radio, uh, uh, podcast feed, organize the unorganized about the history of the CIO. I know I'm going to listen to the whole thing. Uh, thank you again. Hey, thanks, Ben. Was Ben Fong, again, author of Quick Fixes, editor of Damage Magazine, and uh, the uh, host of uh, the uh, the Organized, the Unorganized podcast. All right, so uh, we are going to go to the post game for uh, GTA patrons. Uh, if you are not one of those, then... I don't know. You just need to reflect on how you're living your life, I guess. Uh, but uh, if you want to become one, that is patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. Uh, for five bucks a month, uh, you get access to every single post game on Monday and Thursday nights uh, and uh, access to the Discord server. Sometimes uh, you get uh, advanced content before we uh, we release it on uh, the main feed and, and also on the you know public YouTube channel. Uh, you uh, you get many many good things, but all of these are just ways of saying thank you because uh, really what it is if you're signed up for this is um, solidarity. That's it's a way of supporting the show. If uh, if you want us to be able to keep it going, if you like what we do, so please do consider doing that. Again, Patreon.com/slash Ben Burgess. Uh, we are going to go now to the post game with. Uh, with uh again no jake tonight but we've got andy and we've got ravana uh first time she's been on the show since 2022 uh and um you know it's uh it's the post game and god actually this all feels really good to say it's really good to be back we ended up taking a longer break than anticipated but i'm really glad to be doing this again on monday and thursday nights uh so in any case uh since it's the post game, it's a little bit lighter. So we are going to uh, to answer a essential question that I'm sure has been burning a hole in all of your brains, which is whose spit has been in Alex Jones's mouth? That question is going to be answered in the post game cold open. Uh, we will be back with that for patrons in just a minute. Left his best. <laughs> 